today we're going to be having a conversation on how to harness diplomacy for the energy transition and universal access. And we're so excited to be joined here today on the panel. Let me introduce the panelists. From my, far, my first right, immediate right, is Ambassador Juan Gabriel Valdez, the Ambassador of Chile to the United States. Mr. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you. Next to, next to him is uh, Assistant Secretary Jeffrey Pyatt, who is the who is the Assistant Secretary at the Bureau of Energy Resources at the United States Department of State. So Secretary, welcome, Jeff. Next to him is Ambassador um, Karen Olaf's daughter, who is the Ambassador of Sweden to the United States. Madam Ambassador, welcome. Uh, next to her is Mr. Hidaki uh, Fujisawa, who's the Minister of Economy, Trade, and, Min and Industry at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And they will be left in the hands of uh, our own Andres Gluski, who is the President and CEO of AES Corporation. Andres, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lawrence, and good morning to everyone. And welcome to the seventh Global Electrification Forum. Today, we have a distinguished panel of diplomats from key countries leading the energy transition. And I think that uh, global warming is the most important issue of our time. And um, we have a series of issues to address, challenges and opportunities. In the long term, longer term or medium to longer term, I really think is a question of, do we have all the technologies and do we have all the minerals and resources to get this accomplished? However, in the short term, we face a number of other issues. One is that the uh, Russian war of aggression in the Ukraine has caused a major disruption to oil and gas supplies around the world. In addition, you've had the COVID-19 pandemic, which affected supply chains, especially supply chains coming from Asia, other countries with the shutdowns. And then you have some degree of decoupling between Western economies uh, and China. So we're facing this long-term challenge, the most important challenge. We have these short-term disruptions. We have the issue that this is a global problem. How do we assure access to everyone for the new technologies for uh, clean energy? So it's, it's not an issue that one country can solve. We must solve this all together. So with this panel, we'd like to discuss some of those issues. We'd like to keep it, if you, anyone has any comments about something somebody said, please feel free to do so. But I'd like to go ahead and start and everyone give a sort of two, three minute uh, talk about what their country is doing, what is their focus uh, to address this challenge, this and challenges of the energy transition. So I'd like to start off with uh, Hiyoki Fujisawa, who's a minister for economy, trade and industry of the Embassy of Japan. Okay, okay, thank you very much for ha having me this morning. And uh, my name is uh, Hideaki, so please call me Hide uh, Fujisawa from uh, Embassy of Japan. So, yes, as you know, I uh, originally from uh, Meki uh, of Japan, so Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industries, uh, which covers uh, energy policy together with other industrial policies and uh, trade policies, actually. So, yeah, so as you know, so energy policy or you know, energy security is uh, our central you know, objective uh, to be accomplished, but it's very challenging uh, topic for us. And as uh, so you mentioned that uh, now is a very difficult time to think about a lot of things now. And uh, in the middle of this you know, situation, Japan is uh, the G7 chair this year. And uh, probably as you are aware, this weekend, uh, we held a G7 uh, very long name, uh, climate, <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, climate, uh, you know, energy and uh, environment uh, ministerial meeting at uh, Sapporo in the northern part of Japan to, you know, discuss a lot of things uh, to address. So in, this, in, in the, the discussion, we uh, acknowledge uh, the very difficult situation now to address the you know, trilemma situation, uh, which means uh, you know energy security and the climate crisis plus a geopolitical situation. So today, so I'd like to you know I'm so looking forward <coughs> to sharing some views with uh, colleagues in DC. 
to think about the future of the energy policy or market. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to pass it now to Karen Olofdotter, who is the uh, ambassador from Sweden. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for gathering us here today and also inviting me to, to take part. Uh, well, it's a very timely discussion, of course, just for the reasons that my Japanese colleague spelled out. And right now, Sweden uh, is in the middle of its EU presidency. We hold mm -hmm. a six-month rotating uh, presidency right now. And of course, uh, we are challenged by several in several areas, but they're also mm -hmm. interconnected. So it's, the, of course, the war in Ukraine, uh, the energy crisis coming from that, and then high inflation also part of that uh, game, and then the climate crisis on top of it. And combating the climate crisis is really top priority uh, for us. And as you know, the latest IPCC report told us that the window of opportunity is rapidly closing. Uh, and our decisions and actions that we are implementing today uh, in this decade will have impacts for thousands of years. And when you think about it, it's kind of mind boggling the responsibilities we have today for the future of, of the planet and, and, our, and our children and their children and so on. And of course, as I said early on, and as my Japanese colleague also said, that another driver uh, for the green transition has been Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And of course, uh, this has raised the awareness uh, of the importance of in energy independence. Uh, my country has been quite fortunate. Uh, we have an energy mix that mm -hmm. makes us, uh, as a country, not reliable on any uh, energy resources from Russia, but a lot of other European countries are. So we need to look at energy independence, we need to look at security of supply, both for Sweden and for the European Union. And also by electrifying more of our energy use, uh, we can reduce our dependence on fossil uh, fuels uh, and also increase our security. So we are a proponent of phasing out uh, fossil fuels as soon as possible um, and to improve the security uh, and reach our climate goals in one big bag, so to speak. And we have a national plan of being carbon neutral by 2045. And our current government would like 100% fossil free electricity production by 2040. So that's what we are aiming for. And we have a climate act uh, since quite a long time ago, and that uh, sets long term climate goals. And that's really important for business and you know, the consumers and so on to be able to plan uh, so that it's not jumpy. Uh, so, uh, the Swedish industry and the consumers are really pushing the government for reform. We have a fantastic program called Fossil Free Sweden, and that entails, I think, 22 business sectors, actually, mm. that have taken it upon themselves uh, to be, uh, some of them cut emissions in large part, or be net zero emitters by various years. So, we have actually the first production of fossil free steel coming out of Sweden. The cement industry is uh, doing big advancements. We have the tourist industry, transportation, etc. So this is really what I think is great when it's industry driven. It's it's really bottom up uh, and it, it makes it happen. And uh, we have been at this for a long time and with the oil crisis in the 70s. I remember myself, my father used to have huge American cars. He had a Pontiac. He was a traveling salesman. He sold his big Pontiac in 1974 because he just couldn't take the gasoline price. Price. Uh, then he had an Audi for a while, but then he jumped back to American cars, made him very happy. Oh, <laughs> but anyway, so so we, we this was really hitting our country hard in the 70s, just like many other countries. And that really drove a transition to a, a climate and energy smart solutions. Uh, so uh, today, of course, it's not just an economic reason. For economic reasons, it's also for security reasons. So we are focusing on uh, then phasing out fossil fuels with nuclear and renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, that also includes wind and energy. So currently, 60% of our electricity production comes from uh, renewable energy sources. It's hydro, we are fortunate with rivers. Uh, wind is 17 and solar one, not that much sunshine where we live, <laughs> and 31% from nuclear energy. So uh, I will, uh, you know, stop there. But uh, this this shift that we are seeing, combining all this, of course, uh, coming out of horrible a horrible situation in Europe, we think really can drive uh, innovation uh, and and uh, make our transition actually go faster. And we need to do it. So thank you so much for for having me today. Thank you very much. Well, now I'd like to go to Assistant uh, Secretary of State, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt.
Right. Thank you, Andres. And, and thanks especially <clears throat> to Lawrence and everybody for having me here. Um, I'll be very brief. But what I want to really highlight is, first of all, what I do, what the Energy Bureau at the State Department does. ENR's responsibility is to lead our effort on the geopolitics of energy leveraging America's energy resources, our technology leadership to advance American national security. We're doing this at a moment of two great transitions, which everybody's talked about, the transition to renewables driven by our focus on the climate crisis and the transition away from Russia caused by Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the weaponization of his energy resources, which I will turn back to in just a second. Um, in about seven months in this job, there are a couple of big takeaways that I have so far. One is just the hunger for American engagement. And I was, uh, a week and a half ago, I was in Brussels at the US-EU Energy Council. Uh, the Swedish foreign minister was there at the council as well in the presidency capacity. It was really striking to me, first of all, to see how fast Europe has pivoted away from Russia. I, I think if folks had, had tried to predict uh, 14 months ago, that Germany would go to zero Russian coal, zero Russian crude oil, zero Russian gas. Nobody would have believed it. And I am convinced that that shift is now permanent in Europe. And it reflects the larger disruption that's rippling across global energy markets. A country that until early 2022 was the largest oil and gas exporter in the world has now marginalized itself because of Putin's actions. Um, but also a very strong focus on how we work together with Europe in the context of the energy transition, especially on the issue of critical minerals, a high priority for our Japanese allies, and an issue we talked about in Sapporo yesterday, and a, an issue where our, our partners in Chile also loom very, very large, as Ambassador Valdez and I were talking about, because of Chile's enormous resources on copper, on lithium, and the potential to be a major player in the, the hydrogen economy. So there's a tremendous appetite for American engagement on these issues. In Brussels, it was interesting also the great appreciation that was expressed for American gas producers. And I think that's another important part of the story um, that American companies played an absolutely critical role in helping Europe to uh, defuse the energy weapon that Putin thought he was going to use against our, our European allies. Um, but there are other issues that we're also working on at the State Department. One is the question of energy access. And I think it's important to remember, and I've in this in my current role, I've traveled to India, I've traveled to Pakistan, I'm traveling to Africa later this spring. Um, you can't have those conversations without being reminded of the fact that for much of the world, the energy transition is about the transition from not having energy to having energy. And so how do we help that developing world to fulfill its energy needs in the least climate damaging way possible? So that's where this energy transition becomes so important. And we have to remember, the United States consumes about five times the global average of energy per capita. Africa consumes about one fifth of the global average. And that is a reality that we have to own up to. We also have to recognize, and certainly in the United States, one of the great things about starting the, the job that I have last summer was that it coincided with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which just brought a huge amount of credibility to the United States and the U.S. government in this conversation about energy transition because we're putting our money where our mouth is. But even if the United States completely decarbonized our economy, that's about 15 percent of global CO2. So these issues are, are inherently, um, inherently global, and we will only be successful in advancing our climate goals to the extent we're working with allies and partners around the world. Last two issues. One, um, just to mention, put a pin in the question of nuclear. Uh, I, I think it's very exciting for me as somebody who spent three years working at the IAEA in Vienna, when we were talking about the, energy, the nuclear renaissance in the early 2000s, then F Fukushima came along, that didn't happen. But I think we're, in a, we're going to be in a period of very exciting technological advancement as we look at small modular reactors, um, have American companies really in the position of global leadership on this technology and, and seeing how we how we um, make that technology marketable and, and make the business case for nuclear as part of our overall energy mix. And then all the other transformative technologies that all of you are working on, hydrogen carbon sequestration, novel storage technologies. I was excited when I was in uh, in Long Beach visiting my mother-in-law at Christmas to see the AES grid scale battery storage operation there, the first in the United States of its, of its type. 
And then lastly, and just to finish up on this point in terms of what I do, support to American business is a huge part of my job. Um, I can remember advocating for AES in Pakistan in the mid 90s. And last week I was supporting a G, a GE in the context of their work in Ukraine. So this is part and parcel also of what the State Department is doing on these issues because our our ability to exercise international leadership on these issues is, as I said, intrinsic to American national security, but also to the health and growth of our economy. Well, I'm glad you saw the facility in Alamitos. Yeah. Um, interesting story. We pretty much developed energy storage. We were the first using lithium ion batteries. But a good lead in to Ambassador Valdez is that the first commercial scale energy storage uh, anywhere we did in Chile because Chile had the most forward-looking regulations. This is an interesting case of that uh, technology flows can both go both ways. So with that, I'd like to pass it to Ambassador uh, Valdez from Chile. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see Andres. I haven't seen him for some five years now. <laughs> uh, but the point is that um, Chile has already been mentioned as a, a, a country which is a, a natural laboratory for the production of non-renewable, non-renewables. And uh, uh, given the amount of um, solar radiation we have in the north, the winds in the south, and the long coast, we are favored to produce, for instance, uh, at low cost, green hydrogen, which is something that is has called enormously our attention as a country, and we would like not just to produce to inter for internal consumption, but also for uh, exports and uh, become uh, uh, an, uh, an important uh, participant in the global market that will be developed around uh, hydrogen. AES is participating in that uh, effort, and uh, it has help helped us also to reduce our uh, dependency on the previous types of energy. The, 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 we, we have been reducing um, the, what we have as uh, the, the, met, the carbon neutral. We are, we are going to be carbon neutral or we would like to be carbon neutral to, by 2050. And what I was saying is that coal-fired thermoelectric power plants have been reduced and are being reduced in an important way. Therefore, uh, the fact is that uh, they will be reduced by 70% by 2030. We would like very much also to develop our lithium industry. We have 46% of our reserve of the reserves. Along with Argentina and Bolivia, we have around 70% of the reserves. We have been cooperating with Argentina and discussing with Argentina in these issues, and we think that uh, there is an important mo uh, motivation among the governments in order to make progress on this, which would be important for the region in general. We are also aware that uh, we are open for investments from all over the world, but we would like, and I have said this very publicly recently, we would like very much to have investments coming from the United States. Uh, to the lithium industry uh, in the, the area of uh, in the area of green hydrogen we have already not only the agreements we've i've mentioned with aes and other companies but also with european companies uh, europeans have been making research on green hydrogen during the last three or four years and uh, Corfo, our national agency, has pro has provided funding mm. in order to attract investors to do research on green hydrogen in the country. Therefore, this is a country that conceives itself as a definition as a green country and as a, as a green economy. And in this sense, we will uh, continue to work with everybody who wants to participate in this process um, in the future years. This is what I could say at this point. Thank you. I think Chile has a, a very big role to play in this energy transition. I don't know if people are conscious of it, but as a leading producer of copper, so there's right. one thing I'm willing to bet is that the energy transition will need copper. Leading, I think you're the second global exporter, I think right there with Australia, first, first, first in, in lithium. 
Um, and then the uh, remarkable uh, solar resources that you have uh, in Chile. You put a solar farm up on the Atacama Desert, you're high, you're near the equator, it hasn't rained in 50 years, uh, and you get capacity factors of 38%, uh, which for most people here, usually solar farms are in the 20s. And you get also even good albedo from the reflections of the sand. So Chile has uh, been very advanced in this, and I said, had very forward-looking regulations. Um, they have a carbon tax. It's five dollars per ton, moving up to forty dollars per ton, and they've had this for for some time. So it's it's really a, a, an interesting case of a country that I think this energy transition is remarkably uh, well placed to take uh, this. I would like to go to Mr. Fujisawa and ask a little bit about uh, Japan's views on nuclear, uh, because as Secretary Payet said, uh, a lot of us think that one of the problems of the energy transition is capacity or dispatchable energy. How do you get twenty four seven? Renewables are fantastic, but they're intermittent. So how do you cover this? And, uh, you know, batteries can do part of it, but, um, uh, you know, you still require a tremendous amount of renewables. So nuclear, especially the, you know, we think the small modular nuclear could play a key role. Now, Japan, of course, because of the, you know, uh, natural the disaster it, uh, it uh, uh, you know, has, say, taken a pause on its yeah. nuclear program. Now, the, the question is, you know, how does Japan look for that for the future? Okay, thank you very much uh, for a very important uh, point. Yeah, actually, so Japan is very, you know, serious about uh, the, you know, carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Chris, we committed to some, you know, targets uh, in 2030. And, uh, yeah, right. So, you know, to achieve that uh, very, you know, challenging uh, uh, goals. Uh, we need, uh, you know, uh, nuclear technology. And uh, Japan, for a long time, uh, you know, committed to the you know, development, development of uh, nuclear, uh, power plants or nuclear technology itself. But as you mentioned, so more than 10 years ago, we faced a very difficult situation uh, due to the big earthquake in Fukushima. After that, you know, in Japan, you know, to talking about uh, nuclear itself was uh, so sensitive. Uh, for, and we had big debate uh, in, in Japan uh, to, you know, whether to use a uh, nuclear technology. Still, we face a very difficult situation, but uh, Prime Minister Kishida, uh, you know, uh, took a very strong leadership to restart the nuclear issues. And uh, to the end of this uh, last year, uh, Prime Minister himself, you know, made a commitment to, you know, to consider uh, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, utilize mm -hmm. problems in Japan. Uh, you know, we decided to, to you know, uh, you know, uh, that, that kind of business, you know, power plant, uh, you know, pillows, population of pillows, mm -hmm. it's going to make me be longer. And or uh, you know, other issues as well. So we are very serious about uh, about the you know pop usage of the power plant, and at the same time, so you know, we are very committed to the international cooperation or, or the other advanced advanced uh, reactor, including the SMR, and uh, in order to you know utilize this technology. We need some, you know, investments or we need some, you know, projects all over the world so that, you know, we are very you know, keen on the collaboration with like-minded countries, say, including the United States. So SMR, all the, you know, advanced technology is so important to, you know, broaden this technology over the world. And we need some projects or we need some human resources. We need some, you know, uh, capacity building for that. So Japanese companies and Japanese government is very, you know, eager to have the collaboration with, uh, uh, you know, like many countries. So, 
Thank you. Excellent. Ambassador Olofdar, um, you mentioned some ambitious goals that Sweden had, and Sweden's been a leader in this area. So I was curious, you mentioned the decarbonization of industrial areas, which is very important, like you know, producing carbon-free steel, that, that's remarkable. Um, so I was curious, is you see hydrogen, green hydrogen playing a key role in, in that transition in Sweden? Uh, and a little bit your view, because you know, you also have nuclear. So that's between your excellent hydro and nuclear, you're in a very good position to do this. But know a little bit, how, how is the government thinking? What are the key components? Well, of course, access to affordable or cheap energy mm. has been part of our energy or our industrial success, I would say, for mm. many, many years. And also that we have a Nordic uh, energy right. market. And so we are all interlinked. Right. And when someone has mm. lower energy, uh, uh, right. how do you say, production, we can backfill right. from other countries. And actually, we built the first cable between Sweden and Denmark in 1915 underwater mm. cable. So this has been going on for a long time to, yeah. to make this a regional issue. And as I said, one of, you know, tax, um, companies don't pay tax on energy. Uh, so that's one kind of subsidy we have for, mm -hmm. for our energy market. And this also attracts a lot of investments. And it's so interesting to see the far north of Sweden. We're in the size of California, right. 10 million people, 9 million people basically live from Stockholm and down. And so there's a lot of forest and moose <laughs> and reindeer up north. And and it's been one of those challenging areas, you know, how to build our broadband, how to get people to move up mm. to work. Now it's booming. We have mineral findings. We have, because of the energy and the grid up north, we have um, this steel production that I was talking about. Two, two companies are, are uh, on the forefront of, of carbon-free steel, building new battery factories. North Vault is building a yep. huge one, creating, I think, 10,000 jobs in that small town. So it's really booming. It's bonanza in a way in the far north. And and there our energy mix is crucial because if you want to do carbon-free steel, for instance, the electricity you are providing right. to it has to be carbon-free as right. well. So uh, so this is something that we are uh, trying to export now. and. Uh, I, I just read that one of our big steel companies, LKAB, when um, when they are going to provide uh, investments around the world on carbon-free steel, it will be the same amount as cutting all the emissions that are cut from Sweden. Mm. So it's of enormous yeah. importance that we get this new technology, technology scalable uh, investments. And there, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which we sometimes criticize a lot from the European side for mm -hmm. being protectionist, it also, of course, give, sure. gives great investments opportunities in mm -hmm. the United States. And I think it's, it's fantastic that the United States is really taking climate change and innovation and industrial change so seriously. Yeah, we, we have a contract to buy batteries from Northvolt. Yeah, good. So we, Keep on buying. We can't wait till they come online. <laughs> uh, uh, Secretary Pyatt, I mean, there's so much going on in the States. And uh, I think, as uh, Tom pointed out, I think a lot of countries aren't, don't realize how much we've cut emissions here in the States. Right. Now, it's been two things. It's been the growth of renewables, but it's also been the switch, shutting down of coal plants and using natural gas. So I guess um, a little bit, um, how do we see the sort of energy transition? Because there's all these great technologies we have out there. Yeah. But the question is, it's from you know A to point C, but where are we going to be in the middle, you know, point B, how are we going to get there? And um, here, here in the States, we're fortunate because, you know, we do have areas of great solar, we do have areas of, of great wind, and, you know, the, the advantages of being a continental in size. But, you know, I, sometimes some of the rhetoric gets a little bit ahead of itself, like, you know, when, when can we do this? No, well, thank you. And it's, it's a great question. And I should have said, I, I've been with the State Department for 34 years. Um, the vast majority of that time has been overseas. So it's always interesting me, to me when I come home and um, my home state is California. So coming back to California every couple of years and you see how fast mm -hmm. our energy transition yeah. is evolving domestically. And as you alluded to, Andres, I mean, one of, the, one of the attributes of the U.S. energy economy is our relative bounty. So a big part of our reduced CO2 footprint over the past decade has been fuel switching from coal to gas in the thermal power sector. Um, now there's going to be an intense focus on what additional can be done to mitigate the CO2 impact of that gas through carbon sequestration. 
Um, and, and I think, you know, remember the enormous incentives that the IRA has created for our industry to look really hard at how to push the envelope of the technology on carbon sequestration, on green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most exciting aspects about being an American diplomat working on these issues right now is that our own, our own ecosystem here at the United States is evolving very rapidly in an economy that is the world's best at bringing to bear capital against innovation to drive growth. So I, I think you know the, the, what the future looks like is going to be bounded by uh, two or three things. One is that the United States is going to remain one of the, the most competitive energy generation uh, countries in the world for a long time to come because of this combination of global <clears throat> attributes and our, our fossil resources and our, the incentives that the federal government is providing. Um, two, we have a, a private sector that thinks globally. And if there's one thing that we've all been reminded of over the past four, 14 months, it's that the energy market is completely globalized and that's not going to change. And I think, you know, uh, my Swedish colleague talked about our conversation with Europe on the Inflation Reduction Act. I think that conversation is in a much better place now, thanks to the understandings that have been reached between President Biden and President von der Leyen, our commitment to negotiate with the European Union, a critical minerals agreement like the one we've just uh, reached with Japan uh, to provide the same facilitation that Chile enjoys in terms of access to the U.S battery market as, a, as an FTA partner. Um, similarly, the commitment in both uh, Brussels and Washington to having a serious dialogue on clean energy incentives, recognizing that what we really want to do, we want to drive a race to the top, where we're all challenging ourselves to make that transition move even faster. And, and I think, you know, to finish up my answer to your question, I think the, what I, I in, in my international travels, I have found that many international audiences don't recognize what an enormous impact the Inflation Reduction Act is going to have, what it means when the federal government puts $36 billion a year behind a target for 10 years and the predictability that that provides to the private sector. And then you add to that some of the incentives that the infrastructure bill created, uh, for instance, for green hydrogen hubs here in the United States. So I think it's going to be a very exciting time. It's happening at a moment when the, the energy geopolitics is more central to the national security conversation than it's ever been before. And literally every single bilateral meeting that Secretary State of State Blinken has with his counterparts around the world, and every single one of those meetings, energy comes up right towards the top of the agenda for all the reasons that you know very well. <clears throat> I think you brought something up very important that is, this is not a zero sum game. So, you know, I was, uh, it, that was when the IRA came and there was a lot of European complaints about it. And kind of my response is, you need your own, <laughs> you know, because this is a global problem. So we both have to be working on it. And, you know, to some extent, the Europeans had been leading on this. And I think it's great the United States catched up and incorporated it. Uh, the States brings a remarkable scale because, you know, we've talked a little bit about green hydrogen. Together with Air Products, we, we have the first mega scale uh, green hydrogen facility here in the US. It's one and a half gigawatts. It's a $4 billion investment. But to give you an idea of the scope of the challenge we're facing, that facility can supply 0.1% of the US long haul trucking fleet. So just let that sink in. You got to multiply it by 1,000 to supply the US long haul trucking fleet. In. So that will force down the price of electrolyzers as we gear up in the States. And that will be very beneficial to Europe and European companies, of course, or some of the key suppliers uh, for that transformation. So I think we have to stop thinking of you know, sometimes trade just as a zero sum game, especially when facing the challenge of um, global warming. You know, it's it's two plus two equals six if we work together on this. OK, so I think we've touched uh, a number of one area that we have to talk perhaps a little bit more. And I think Sweden's had a key role here is really sort of helping with the affordability in, in the developing countries. And, you know, as a percentage of GDP, I think you're the most generous or one of the most generous countries uh, around. Um, and we're having huge demographic shifts, which um, to me is it, I'm an economist by training that I, I think it's short shrift, you know, in terms of countries that are uh, actually contracting or getting older, 
countries that are moving in. You know, one of the big problems is sub-Saharan Africa, let's face it. That's, that's where the population growth will occur over the next 15 years, 50 years. And um, this is an opportunity because there's a lot of um, electrification which has to occur. Uh, but also there's an opportunity to uh, leapfrog technologies. You know, they don't have to go through all the steps, for example, that, that, that uh, the advanced OECD countries did. So maybe a little bit sort of what, how Sweden is handling this issue. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's one, of course, one of the most important questions we have is global mm -hmm. access to energy. If we really want to lift people out of poverty, uh, this is what we need to do. And we always talk about, for instance, girls going to school. You need electricity. <laughs> and uh, I haven't visited Africa that many times, but uh, really realized what uh, the challenges were, of course. So, as you said, we are one of the most uh, generous when it comes to development cooperation or development aid, and we have been focusing on uh, energy in Africa. Mm -hmm. We were the first country actually to sign up on Power Africa, uh, this great initiative taken by the United States in 2013. Mm -hmm. We actually just had a discussion with USAID Saturday in, or during World Bank Week on, mm -hmm. uh, on what, we, what we can do more. So we have doubled our contribution to the Green Climate Fund, for instance. Um, and we are then, as, as I said, supporting developing countries is a priority when it comes to, to energy. And we really want to see what we can do more when it comes to Power Africa, which is a great initiative for mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan Africa. And realizing also, as you said, demography uh, will mean that we will need to produce much more energy in the future, just not providing energy, but also growing mm -hmm. uh, the supply. And there is, as you said, technolo technological shift is paramount. We see the solar development is, of course, amazing, uh, but it's, it's scaling it. Uh, that's one of the, I think, one of the most important issues and that we all then find ways of finding the, fin no, how do you bridging the financial gap? Because this is where the real problem lies, oh. uh, to get the financing together. So, uh, Secretary Payet, uh, in terms of what, you know, this is a U.S. initiative. Could you give us a little bit more color on it? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to emphasize is the point I made in my opening remarks about the, um, the proportionate energy availability that mm -hmm. Africa sees today. And this is not just an Africa problem also. It's an East Asia problem, a South Asia problem. Um, and you've got large um, young populations um, who are at the point in their growth trajectory where demand is growing significantly. And you know, to take the India example, for instance, you know, India continues to grow 6 7% a year, but their growth in energy demand is actually significantly greater because they're at a point in their growth trajectory where the marginal um, growth is happening at the middle class, where people want to have air conditioners and televisions and computers and all of those things. And the same applies in Africa. And then I think we also have to be sensitive, um, especially when we talk with Africa, we have to be sensitive to the questions around um, how the continent exploits its own resource endowments, um, its fossil endowments, and also its, its mineral endowments. And, and I think the State Department has a significant initiative called the Mineral Security Partnership, which is meant to bring together big G7 and other developed countries with countries um, that have significant endowments of these minerals that are going to be so important to the energy transition, cobalt, lithium, um, uh, graphite, etc. And to, to create a alternative to the Chinese business model, which has been the extraction of ores and then the shipment of that product back to China where all the value addition and all the processing happens in China. So we're trying to break that. And I, I was part of a conversation that Secretary of State Blinken had um, back in September at the United Nations when we had our first big mineral security partnership ministerial. And I will always remember one of the African ministers who came up to me afterwards and said, you know, thank you so much that the United States is talking to us now about these issues because we hadn't paid enough attention. The Biden administration has made a very strong commitment to our engagement with Africa. We saw that at the Africa Leaders Summit in December and then all the visits from cabinet officials, including my boss, Secretary Blinken, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, uh, Secretary Yellen, Vice President Harris just a couple of weeks ago, all traveling to Africa. 
where these energy issues are are front and center in the in the conversation. And I think the the interesting question will be, Andres, the one that you alluded to. How do we how do we have a conversation with these develop with the developing world that respects their sovereignty, their own choices about their energy, uh, their energy future, but allows the possibility of short circuiting the transition um, to renewable power in the same way that much of the developing world skipped over the copper landline AT&T mm-hmm. phase of telephony going mm-hmm. straight to mobile. So it's the same kind of technological inflection moment. And that's where I think the United States wants to be a strong partner. And, and the mobile uh, revolution, where you know, Eric son and Nokia and everybody played also a key role, uh, really did uh, dramatic improvements in people's living standards in, in a way, or, or well-being, I think, that which we hadn't seen. So going to Ambassador Valdez, I mean, Chile is really an example, you know, of, of a, it's an OECD country, it already qualifies as a high-income country, but, you know, in terms of a country that's uh, doing everything that uh, the Secretary mentioned, of, you know, developing its resources, helping the world in this green energy transition, and also, I think, giving an example to, to other countries in, in, in the third world. Well, um, we have always resisted the idea of being a, an example or anything like a model. But let me say that uh, because of good reasons, I have to say. Um, but what the United States has proposed us uh, recently, the American Partnership for Economic Prosperity, which means that the Latin American countries uh, will be able to develop a dialogue with the United States in areas which are critical for their development, among them energy, among them investments, uh, opens a new opportunity. And I think that uh, this should be uh, underlined. At the same time, we have looked with enormous interest to the Inflation Reduction Act, of course. And the reason for that is that we are a country that has had for the last 20 years now uh, a free trade agreement with the United States, which is quite wide and open, and also a free trade agreement with Europe, with the European uh, Union. In these conditions, therefore, we will be able to export our lithium to the US and also to Europe and also to Japan if the agreements between the United States and Japan are, are closed, are finished. Uh, and we see that with enormous interest. We have always exported our copper. When uh, it happened to me that when you mentioned copper, I was I, I always think that it is so obvious that Chile exports <laughs> copper. <laughs> it's in our th- natural description yeah, yeah. that I sometimes forget to mention it. But of course, the need for copper will be double or f- four times what it is today in order to change the, si- the system and to make the transition. Therefore, uh, these uh, possibilities of uh, participating in a better way in the new economy uh, is extremely important to us. And uh, we have discussed with the United States that in the area of energy and in other areas in which certain regulations have been successful in our countries, we are very much prepared not just to participate in a dialogue with the U.S., but in a dialogue in the region and in, in the hemisphere in order to help to build a stronger hemisphere around these these issues. Well, I think um, Chile is an for me it is an example. I mean, uh, you had your own gas crisis in two thousand and two when uh, basically Argentina decided to consume its, all of its own gas. I was in Argentina as ambassador at the time. <laughs> I will never forget that. <laughs> well, you know it very first, had, but Chile reacted very quickly. So yes. Chile has had the, a very pragmatic approach and. And I, I really do mention the electric uh, regulations, because right now we're working with AES is working with some technology partners to virtualize the network and using AI to run you know, millions of simulations to, to know how to uh, dispatch it better, know how to react to, let's say, uh, uh, catastrophes better. Um, and, you know, tremendous opportunities here in the States, but where we're piloting it is in Chile, because we always find that that's a country that uh, is open to the new technologies that you can actually try it work very well with the regulators. So in that way, I think it's uh, an example. Uh, 
Uh, Minister uh, Fujisawa, we have not uh, mentioned Japan's role also in the sort of electrification of uh, those countries which have a demographic boom and also a need to electrify. And perhaps you could provide us some color on that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, actually, first of all, as an Asian country, uh, we are the only G7 member from uh, Asia. So I'd like to echo the, this, you know, the previous discussion uh, about the importance of uh, engaging the global mm -hmm. south. And actually, this uh, weekend, uh, when we had a discussion at G7, Ministerial for Energy, yeah, one of the important uh, topic is to is uh, how to engage the global south countries. So as uh, you know, uh, Assistant Secretary Pio said, you know, now we are facing a very really difficult uh, you know geopolitical situation, and uh, some critical minerals are so dependent on the specific country. So we need to you know make uh, the supply chain more resilient one more diversified, where we need to tackle this issue. But we can do that without any, you know, collaboration with the global South country. At the same time, uh, so these countries are very, you know, suffering from the, you know, high gas price due to Russian invasion. So Europe it plans uh, necessarily to get more uh, LNG from the United States after the invasion uh, because you know you know they don't they they can't you know you know uh, be dependent on Russian gas so and you know energy market is very tight so that Asian countries are not able to you know gain their energy and leading to the more dependence on coal it's not okay for the climate change. So we need to, you know, tackle this difficult situation by, you know, uh, proposing our ideas or our project to the global south. It's very important, and we try to, you know, take initiative to, you know, bleach the Western countries and other global south countries. So that's a very important point. And the other point is that, you know, of course, Japan is a very small island, less uh, natural resource. So we can do anything with any assistance from the uh, rest of the world. So we like to be a kind of a, you know, a pioneer to realize that, you know, new energy system or to tackle the climate crisis and uh, to be more secure energy system. So the climate uh, himself decided, oh, you know, to the uh, you know green transformation policy uh, this uh, mid February, and uh, we you know published the basic plan for the you know uh, green transformation. Uh, which try to achieve uh, both, you know, carbon neutral society and, uh, you know, economic growth. So in the discussion, we tackle with the nuclear issues, as I said, and uh, we are looking, we are doing other, you know, a system for the carbon pricing or others. But, uh, you know, and we uh, are committed to, you know, uh, support uh, 20 trillion, which means uh, around the uh, one five, I mean, 15 billion US dollar for 10, 10 years uh, to provide uh, the, some, you know, uh, chance to introduce uh, green, cleaner energy. And uh, it's, it's a it's not more than the, the amount of IRA, but mm -hmm. uh, it's a quite similar style uh, to uh, uh, for the kind of, you know, uh, in the government support this industry. So my point is that you know, we try to be or kind of a coordinator or a pioneer of uh, this uh, you know cleaner energy and uh, more secure the supply chain. Thank you. 
So we are very happy to collaborate all of you uh, to achieve that goal. If I may jump, jump in, because there's some uh, debate if, you know, going uh, greener when it comes to energy and so on, if that will hurt our industries. But I think Sweden is an example where we introduced carbon mm -hmm. pricing early 90s, gradual increase. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've cut our emissions about, I think, 30%, but grown our economy by 80 oh. in the same time. So, you know, it's, it's right. really possible to do it. And also the consumers mm -hmm. want this these days. Yes, that's, a, that's an important point. And, mm -hmm. and increasingly investors as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so to have access to the capital, you have to have a green agenda. Yeah. Um, what's interesting on, the, on this panel is that, um, you know, we're facing a global problem. And um, to the to how much we actually cooperate, I was just thinking of, you know, projects that we do anywhere in the world. Uh, we'll very likely have an Asian partner, Japanese or Korean or European partner. And of course, we're an American company. So it's, it, like, it's hard for me to think of any projects which are, you know, solely one country. And, and when you source the parts. Um, but we also face the fact that, uh, you know, we have to do our part, but we also, have, India, for example, uh, we have to uh, help India with the technologies to make this green transition. And they have their own, uh, uh, you know, challenges with their network and, and the size of the population. And quite frankly, China also has to continue to play a role uh, because, you know, China has obviously helped very much with the supply chain of renewables. And, and we learned through COVID. I mean, I learned that suddenly when they would shut down ports that uh, you thought an equipment was coming from, you know, let's just give an example, you know, uh, Germany or something, but then the nose cone came from China. So you couldn't install your wind turbine because the ports were shut down. So how interconnected, and this global solution will require all of us uh, cooperating. Um, and again, taking the, the example uh, that uh, Secretary Pyatt mentioned, you know, we have to work with the host nations. I mean, we, in many cases, work with, uh, uh, try to work with local partners. You know, for a long time, our biggest financer in Chile were the Chilean pension funds, you know, so that they felt uh, a stake as well in, in terms of the projects uh, going forward. So we have about uh, 10 minutes left. And I think we've, uh, I guess though, the one subject we should maybe uh, talk a little bit more is, is sort of uh, resilience in the supply chain. And, uh, you know, one of the things we have to admit that you know, rare earths aren't really that rare, uh, but nobody wants to process them. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the things, you know, how are we going to tackle that? Uh, you know, perhaps making them less uh, polluting and, and, and more acceptable. But, you know, quite frankly, that's why some of these things have been, uh, you know, sort of outsourced to China. Yeah, sure. Sure. I, I'm happy to jump in on this one. And I, I should say, I mean, my, my version of this last October, when Russia began targeting the Ukrainian energy grid, I was asked by the White House to lead the whole of US government effort to help avert a catastrophic failure of the Ukrainian energy grid. And as Secretary of State Blinken joked in one of the meetings that he had with G7 counterparts, all of a sudden, all of these ministers became experts on 900 KVA auto transformers, <laughs> where they came from, um, how long it took to procure them, and um, how vulnerable networks were if you took out one of these things. Um, and, and I think it goes to a point, Andres, that you alluded to, which is um, everybody has recognized the importance of building more diverse and um, resilient supply chains. As our European counterparts said at the US-EU Energy Council a couple of weeks ago, it would be a tragedy to replace an era of European dependence on Russian fossil fuel for an era of collective dependence on Chinese clean tech supply chains. And, and we need to be clear, um, this is not just a question of critical minerals, but you, if you look up and down the clean tech supply chain, China has been extremely effective of developing monopolies and near monopolies on everything from hydrogen electrolyzers to wind turbines to silicon wafers and solar arrays to battery mm -hmm. minerals. And so you're seeing now a really concerted effort to diversify away from that dependence. We're never gonna get to zero. It's not about decoupling. Right. As our European colleagues like to say, it's about de-risking. Right. Um, so in the United States, we have the IRA, which unapologetically makes the case for reshoring and friendshoring some of these technologies. Likewise, Europe is developing its own critical minerals legislation to incentivize domestic processing in the European Union. 
Um, this is good for all of us because it is not a good situation for us to be as dependent as we've been. And, and I think American companies are going to play a critical role. Um, you know, you have to, this is, I think, one of the challenges that we face in which the Biden administration has been squarely focused on. Look, for instance, at, at solar technology. And, and solar is so important to the energy transition globally. And if you look at the the near monopoly, 90% plus Chinese domination of some of the aspects of that solar supply chain. This is a technology that was invented at Bell Labs in upstate New York. Um, yet Europe and the United States really lost that lead. This is one reason why the India relationship is so interesting to me, because India is a country like the United States. India has a program of production, PLIs, pr production link incentives for both solar and hydrogen um, supply chain commodities. Um, and they also have the, the labor uh, prices and industrial capacity to be a credible alternative to, um, uh, to China on some of these. So that's why, for instance, for the Development Finance Corporation, the US DFC, DFC's largest single um, uh, commitment anywhere in the world is the first solar um, solar manufacturing facility in India. So I, I think the situation is not hopeless, but it's going to take concerted work. It's going to take um, the kind of resourcing that the federal government can mobilize here in the United States, but also the closest possible relationships with our international partners, including all three of the countries that are represented on the panel here this morning. Yeah, I think business, we, we were, uh, definitely after COVID moving towards regionalization. So for example, you mentioned the North Volt factory in Northern Sweden, that will supply our uh, battery needs, for example, for the area of, of Africa and Europe, you know, because it, it, we just can't have a situation where ports shut down and, you know, cost companies billions of dollars, you know, you just couldn't meet your commitments. So I think nobody's going to take that risk again, a little bit like Again, when Chile experienced the gas cutoff from Argentina, you're not going to put yourself no, no in that situation yeah. again. You know, seriously, you should, this is a, so we are moving towards a more, um, you know, I think all businesses towards a more uh, uh, secure, you know, uh, resilient supply chains, uh, which is evolving fast. I, I think one of the things that's very interesting is it's not, we need more of everything, but we also need to be smarter. We need smarter grids. Uh, we need uh, to use AI to, to help us uh, manage this better. Uh, so we need greater efficiency. And we also do need, even though we can go very far with existing technologies, we do need to uh, come up with alternatives because you know how much lithium would the world can the world produce? You know some of these things you project out it's like 20 times, 40 times. Well, it's just not going to happen, or 10 times the amount of copper. Uh, so I think we also have to work uh, collectively uh, in a, a spirit of cooperation. I think is is very important to address this um, uh, global challenge that we're having. And, you know, COVID, the, the aggression in Ukraine, these things have, have made this, the short term, much more difficult. So I think we have like three Just minutes left. I'd like that I each one to make a closing. Oh, sorry. Yes, Ambassador Valdez. No, no, no. If, it, if there is a closing comment, no, no, I it, it's, We have time. Well, no, I wanted to comment that um, when you were mentioning that Chile was in the OECD and that, uh, well, we, are, we were not a poor country. Uh, and at the same time, the question of more pollution as a result of, for, for example, the exploitation of uh, lithium. We are facing, in that sense, a very difficult choice. And uh, uh, around that issue, I would like to, to, to underline the importance of developing the ability to incorporate communities yes. and local communities in the discussion and, sure. and in the, the planning and in the, uh, in the, the realization of the programs and the projects. I think that we have made a lot of progress on that, but it is clear that there are new challenges which will create life, will make that life difficult to people. And uh, this is a cultural transformation that we need to face. And I think that it is important to develop this ability to the most. No, that, that's a very good point. I think nowadays any type of project has to take into account the local stakeholders much, much, much more than it did uh, in years uh, prior. So, Minister. Uh, yep. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, this you know, flash discussion. And actually, so, yeah, I'd like to emphasize the importance of uh, the, you know, pragmatic approach 
actually to tackle the very complicated situation now. So yeah, so we should engage global south, but we need to pay attention to their you know national circumstances, so that we need to prepare for the you know uh, various uh, pathways to you know, achieve uh, the you know, global goal. So we need to uh, I guess, be, you know uh, listen to their voice. Uh, so probably that's uh, our Japan's important you know, role to you know you know take a leadership to to share their understanding and uh, with uh, our you know uh, global goal. So thank you very much. Uh, actually, collective actions are so quite uh, so uh, you know discussion fruitful for us. So thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you so much. I think it's been a great discussion. So really, thank you for, for inviting. Just to underline again that we need to create systems that hold for extreme stress, what we are mm. seeing right now. We also uh, need to have uh, protection for consumers, of course. Uh, and we also need to uh, avoid high and volatile pricing because this puts a lot of strain on the households, In for instance, in our part of the world. And we need security of supply. And as I also said, we need to find a solution to Gap, so we can really electrify uh, all of the world where it's needed, and it needs to be competitive. We can't, we can't have subsidy race to the bottom. It must be competitive solutions that are industry driven that we are finding. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Maybe just to, to finish on a note, alluding to something Ambassador Olafstadter talked about, which is the the economic and commercial opportunity of this very disrupted moment of transition. And the one other issue there that I would uh, that I would touch on, which none of us have really mentioned as much as we should, which is uh, efficiency. Um, and this is linked to the tech issue also. The technology offers the prospect of using the energy resources that we possess even more efficiently than has traditionally been the case. And again, this is where America still leads the world in terms of the ability of our tech companies. And I was ambassador in Greece for six years before coming back to Washington. And I worked a lot with Google and Microsoft and Cisco and all of our tech giants. And one of the things you I learned early on was that all of them thought of themselves also as energy companies with their smart cities applications and their smart grid applications and all of that. So I, I think this is gonna be a very exciting period to be engaged on these issues. It's a moment that I'm sure for if you're a, a business planner, it probably gives you a headache every evening because there are so many externalities and so many variables. Um, but the urgency is there because of the climate crisis, because of the urgency of, of reducing the, the climate impact of the energy resources that our economies need, but also the urgency of delivering uh, greater energy justice and especially addressing these issues around the developing world that we talked about. So excited to be engaged on this. Uh, Delighted and grateful for the invitation to be part of the conversation and hope we can continue it in different settings. Very good. Ambassador Valdez. Thank you very much for this uh, meeting and for the for this discussion. I think it is extremely important, is a, is a, is a very important part of our diplomacy and diplomatic task. Uh, and uh, um, taking what uh, my friend Payet was saying just now, for a country like Chile, this is an enormous challenge, not, not simply because we have an opportunity ahead of us which could make of us a, 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 a developed country, but also because we need to be extremely careful in the way in which we do it. We need to have efficiency, but at the same time, we need to have care, take care on the way in which we are doing things. And in that sense, uh, the issue of uh, the issue of acquiring technology, the issue of learning, the issue of transferring knowledge to countries which are in this kind of path is extremely important, is crucial for the way in which the relationship between investors and the countries that invest on this and the countries that receive the investment and have to exploit their own wealth will develop in the future. Well, I want to thank our panelists for a very interesting discussion. And uh, these are definitely very interesting times. So thank you all very much. Thank you.